go with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 14. And we're going to read verses 19 and 20 in your hearing. I also want to say thank you so much for coming out to Bible study. Y'all showed out uh, Wednesday. Church is almost full of everyone coming to Bible study, and I'm glad to know that we have a hungry church. And so make sure you come back this Wednesday as we continue to grow in the Word of God. Acts chapter 14, verses 19 and 20 says, Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples, when the believers gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Bay. For the next few moments, I would like to use as a thought, I believe in you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I believe in you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I believe in you. Uh, recently, our family was out spending time together, and we had a very interesting conversation about a variety of different things. And my wife, while we were talking, requested that I give her funds for something that she wanted to do. So I responded with a number that was below what she desired. And while we were talking and going back and forth about this potential transaction, my son said to, to my wife, well, mom, how much do you need? And she said, oh, no, 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 son. Don't, don't, don't get it twisted. I don't need it. I want it. And while she said that, a thought came to me. How many people don't know the difference between what they need and what they want? And when you don't know the difference you can make a want decision thinking it's a need decision. And the decisions you need to make, you don't make because you think it's a want decision. And I believe everybody in this room can testify. At one point of your life, you made a need decision when it was a want. And you made a want decision when it was a need. Uh, yeah. 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 And so when, when we come to this realization, it's sometimes you don't really learn sometimes what you need until you make the want decision. And sometimes you don't know what you want until you make the need decision. And what we live in today is a time where people have to know what they need. And the one thing we all need is God. We need God. We're living in a society where people don't even recognize him. Statistics are showing us that people are not even coming to church the way they used to. Stats are also showing us that the next generation, they are um, claiming to be people of faith, but not necessarily Christians. And it's because we have not done the best job explaining the faith. Because when they had questions, we couldn't answer them. So when you can't answer what you say you believe in, then I have to question what you believe in because you can't give me an answer about what you believe in. And so even though we've shouted and we've danced, even though we've given high fives and paid tithes and offerings and served, the challenge is we don't know what we believe because if we're honest, we don't have as strong of a relationship with our Bible the way we should. I'm not judging you. I'm not throwing stones at you. I'm saying that the church pastors have not done their job. We have not done our jobs well. We got so focused on how many people are coming. We got distracted on how 
parking lot was flowing and what first time guest situations look like and what the marketing looks like and how can we make it more attractive to the point that it was more about butts and seats than souls being saved. It became more about uh, an experience where people could love us and come, but yet we have nothing behind to show that we really support them. But we live in a time where people not only need the word, I've also learned that people want it. People are looking for answers and it is our job to explain it. And as the church, I believe in the Bible. I believe we need to preach the word. I believe when we preach the word, people respond to the word, not cliches, not one liners, but the word because the word is powerful all by itself. You can read this Bible and read a chapter and the Lord say something to you. Pick it up two days later and read the same chapter and God say something else. Because it's not like a regular book on your shelf. This is a living document. It is, it breathes, it speaks to us and it knows how to speak to us where we are. And not only know where we are, but where we are going. And so there has to be a shift where our desire is to the scriptures and to God and so that we learn more about him. And when we look, we see the major shifts where God speaks to us. God always spoke through his word. God spoke to Noah. God spoke to Jeremiah. God spoke to Isaiah. God spoke to Mary. God spoke to Joshua. God spoke to Esther. God spoke to James, John, Peter, and the apostle Paul. And the list goes on when you need something to take place in your life and shift you to the next level what you need is not a drink what you need is a word from the Lord and when you can get a word from God he impacts your life for the better which brings us to our text we read Acts chapter 14 verses 19 and 20 but in order for us to appreciate and to understand Acts chapter 14 verses 19 and 20 we have to back up to Acts chapter 13. Now, we have to back up to Acts chapter 13 because we need to know the whole story. Because if I just simply isolate this particular text, then what I can do is uh, create an experience and you not know all the information. It's kind of like walking past somebody, hearing a part of the conversation, and then you go tell somebody what you heard, but you didn't hear the whole thing. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. That, so, so we want to make sure we know the whole story. So in Acts chapter 13, the Bible says that Paul is preaching in a place called Antioch of Pisidia. While he is there preaching, the Bible says he goes to the synagogue. And while he's there, those in the synagogue ask him to speak. When he gets up and he begins to speak, he begins to preach the word. Now, hear me. you got to read Acts chapter 13 in your leisure. But what he does, he goes down the historical uh, calendar. He literally goes down biblically, historically, and spiritually of how Jesus was prophesied to come. He, he, he walks down that word so clear that, that what happens are the Gentiles and the Jews are amazed at how much he knows and they're attracted to know that Jesus was a thought of God and that he was just not a man merely born of another woman. And when they heard it, they believed it. And the Gentiles said, man, that word was so good. Can you come back next week and preach again? It's called like an extended revival. And so the Apostle Paul said, not a problem, I'll come back next week. By the time Paul gets there the following week, hear me, it goes from a few who was in the synagogue to the next week, the whole city showing up. Because people want the word if we preach the word. And so now the Gentiles are coming. They're amazed at what they heard. They want to learn more and they want the Apostle Paul to teach them. And the Bible says that when the crowd shows up, that when the city shows up, that when those around the surrounding areas now show up at the church service, it is now packed out and the parking lot is an issue and the, and, and, and the website is shut down and they don't have enough seats in the room and everything is overflowing. The Bible says the Jews became envious of Paul because of the multitude. Not what he preached. 
they got mad because a crowd showed up when Paul preached. Now, I'm in the book. Now, you preaching, nobody showed up. Somebody else starts preaching, they show up. Now you mad at them because people are showing up for them, but they're not showing up for you. So now what you have to do is now throw stones at them to say what they're not doing because they didn't show up for you. Okay, let me take it out of church. You got promoted. People started coming to you, started talking to you, asking you for advice, but they've been working there before you got there, and now they're trying to figure out why everybody like you, why everybody talking about you, why everybody Everybody want to meet with you. Why everybody want to do lunch with you? Nobody meet with me. Something wrong with them. No, something wrong with you. Because if you had it, they would have come to you before the other person showed up. And you just need to digest the reality that there's some things you just don't have. And the Bible says they envy Paul. This word envy means they got hot. <laughs> it means they got angry at Paul. See, you got to understand they got mad because of the crowd. They got mad because Paul's influence was beginning to grow. They were getting upset because his notoriety was expanding. And I came to tell you, some people can't celebrate what God is doing in your life because they wanted that to happen in their lives. But can I tell you this? The Apostle Paul is walking out of his call. If you're taking notes, here's my first point. I want to call this the attack of visibility. Because many of you may feel that, no, I'm going to walk with God, but I'd rather work in the background. I don't want nobody to know my name. I just want to come in and get out. I want to make my contribution, sneak out through the back door. Nobody has to know I was even in the room. All right. Now, now here's the thing. There are some uh, behind-the-scenes people. Everybody is not called to be out front. But when God does call you to be a face of something, you will be attacked because of the visibility alone. You can't be visible and not be a target. I need you to embrace this. You can't be visible and not be a target. They're upset because people are coming to hear the Apostle Paul preach. And it's interesting that he is being a target in this moment. Listen to me because he, he's made the decision to walk out his call. When you make a decision to walk out your call, hell gets mad. Because they lost another one. See, you don't understand that the devil is upset when you become more knowledgeable about who you are and what he's called you to be. And the more clearer you become about your assignment and the seasons that you are in, you become more of a threat and a weapon against the kingdom of darkness. So then he has to intensify the attack so that he can distract you from your assignment. And some of you have been under attack because the attack's assignment is to distract you from what he called you to do and I need you to embrace the reality that some of you you have a target on your back that's why everything is coming at you that's why people are saying things about you that's why rumors are being spread about you that's why people got stuff to say to you or about you and you're trying to figure out where it's coming from it's because it's the attack of visibility let me explain my point a little further the apostle John or rather John the Baptist is 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 it's doing many ministry outside of the city when he's doing ministry outside of the city the bible says that herod marries a woman by the name of herodias now herodias is herod's sister-in-law okay let me okay herodias is married to philip herodias leaves philip her husband to go to herod her brother-in-law John the Baptist said, what kind of foolishness is this? And he calls it out. He says, God ain't going to bless that. Why do you think you can leave your husband and then go across town and live with somebody else and marry them and think God's going to bless that? Herodias is so mad. She's trying everything she can possibly do to kill John and get him out of here. But she can't touch him. And then one day while her husband is drinking a little too much. 
She sends, look at, the, look at the wickedness of this. She sends her daughter, which is his niece, into a room to dance seductively in front of her uncle. And then when the drunk uncle then says, you can have whatever you want. You can have whatever you like. <laughs> Ask whatever you want, I'm going to give it to you. And then she says, well, I don't know because I didn't come in here dancing for no other reason because I've been instructed to. She goes back to her mother. She says, mom, unk said, I guess she said unk, uh, said I can have anything in the kingdom I want. She said, you go back in there and say you want the head of John the Baptist. So now she goes in and says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And Herod in this moment has so much regret because as a king, he knew he could not declare something and change his mind. So he knew in the moment that he was tricked and deceived by a woman he made covenant with. And now he has to kill John the Baptist because of what she has done. You got to be careful of people because if they have enough time to leave a situation that benefits them why you don't think they are gonna make other decisions that benefits them and sacrifice you y'all ain't talking back to me there are some people who don't care about nobody but themselves you gotta read the pattern I'm not judging you I'm just looking at what it says and the Bible says now John the Baptist became a target and died because he stood up and spoke the truth to power and when you begin to speak truth to power, it can put a target on your back. When we want to have an honest conversation about something, it can put a target on your back. And so the Bible now says that they come to John. If you go to uh, Acts chapter 13, I believe it's verse 45. He goes on as he preaches. And the Bible says, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Watch this. And contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. So this is what it means, okay? They don't like that the multitude came, now they hot. So what they do is they start telling everybody Paul is a liar. Paul ain't preaching the truth. They start spreading rumors. Then they not only spread rumors about Paul, talking about Paul behind his back. Then they came back and came to his face. I don't know who you think you are. You came here, you doing this, and they said all these other things to Paul. And here it is. You got to understand that words hurt more than stones. Yeah, I remember that saying when you were a kid. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We all know that's a lie. Because some of us are still battling words that have been spoken to us years ago. Things that have been planted in our minds that we struggle with because words are eternal. Words don't go away. Words always stay. God spoke the, the created the world of his words. It still stays around no matter. So as long as you live and you always going to have to deal with the words that have been spoken, this is why we have to be careful about what we say. So now what I like about Paul y'all gonna like this he had a comeback spirit Paul said you just gonna come to me talking to me sideways I'm gonna come back to you verse 46 then Paul right he says that Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first but since you reject it you and judge yourselves unworthy of the everlasting life behold we turn to the Gentiles in other words he said the only reason why you don't have it is because you rejected it how are you jealous of what God is doing in somebody else's life when God gave you the opportunity, but you rejected it, somebody else received it, and they using what they've learned? You got to watch out how we took the same class and left with two different lessons. Oh, y'all are hearing me. How did we attend the same service and left with two different words? How did we go to the same place and leave with two different experiences? It's because some people are rejecting what they heard versus other people are receiving what they heard. And I want to talk to all the receivers that says, God, whatever you're trying to do in my life, I am open. I am receptive to whatever it is I need to do because you have called me for such a time as this. And so now, 
So now Paul and Barnabas get bold and they snap back. They clap back. And they say, wait a minute, you're not going to come for me. I'm going to come right back. Oh. So you got to understand, Paul was like, I'm not going to take this. He says, you could have had it, but you rejected it. So since you rejected, God opened the door for the Gentiles. But I, what I love is in verse 48, then when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified about what God was doing in their lives and about the word. Listen to me. Hear me. Here's point number two. Keep being a blessing. I had to learn this the hard way. Sometimes you can be so focused on your problems and or people around you that you may feel are against you. I remember there was a time I was struggling with some things and I was in a grocery store one day and I, I ran into someone and they said to me, they said, let me tell you something. There are more people cheering you on than you know. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, there are more people celebrating you than you know about. Now, you, you got to know that because they may not come and tell you that they're celebrating you. But let me tell you what they are doing. When your name come up in rooms, they're defending you. They're saying, don't talk about them. Let them do what they're doing. If God's going to open that door, let God open that door for them. And if God's blessing them to do something, don't speak against it. Support it. Somebody was saying to me, something, okay, I'm going to just put it right here. Somebody texted me one day and said, I'm just, we local. We local? Okay, we local. Somebody said, did you see what Bishop Eric Davis did? And he trying to buy that mall on the other side of town. What you think about it? I say, I ain't got nothing to say about it. I ain't responsible for the note. I ain't responsible for the vision. I ain't got to staff it. I ain't got to pay for nothing. He could, I pray much success on everything he does. I'm not praying against them. I pray it works out, whatever his vision is. See, that's the problem. I don't know why he did that. He did this. It's, no, shut up. You just need to focus on you. I said it. Shut up. You need to focus on you and let wherever the chips going to fall. I got too much on my side of town to be worried about what somebody else is doing on the other side of town. I'm sorry, I, I don't have enough time. I got my own problems, trying to figure out my own life. I ain't got time to figure out mine and his. <laughs> Celebrate somebody else. Somebody else get a new house. Go, girl. That's what I'm talking about, bro. When you getting your next property, I'm getting ready to buy another house in another five years. You better do the doggone thing. Look at, celebrate. I got a promotion. Celebrate them. The Bible says rejoice with them that rejoice. If you can't celebrate somebody else's success, what's wrong with you? That means you think you should have it, but I came to tell you, if you get in the vicinity of other people that God is blessing, you can't be in that circle and God not eventually get was on them on you continue to be a blessing don't allow people to make you change pressure and trying to appease people will make you change I know what I'm talking about I've done it you're trying to mold and trying to adjust so no matter where you go, you, you're not offending anybody. You're not rubbing anybody the wrong way. You're so focused on trying not to mess with nobody else, you're losing you. Continue to be the blessing that God made. If you need to work on something, work on it. If you need to work on your tone, work on your tone. If you need to work on your presentation, work on your presentation. You need to work on your prayer life, work on your prayer life. I'm not saying you already arrived. What I'm saying is be you and stop making other people make you change into somebody they want you to be and you lose your assignment. Let me get to the good part. So the Bible says that the people didn't wander there. So they in Antioch and they kick them out. I got to hurry up. They kick him out of Antioch. So he says, fine, y'all don't want me here. No problem. I'll leave. So he leaves Antioch, and he goes to a city called Iconium. Now, when he gets to Iconium, the Bible says he starts to preach, and the people 
are coming again. So while he's, while he's preaching and he's doing all of this, the Bible says they waited a long time and spoke boldly in the Lord who was bearing the witness of the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders. So now what's happening is miracles and signs and wonders of following the disciples. Therefore, watch this, but the multitude of the city was divided because some Jews from Antioch decided to travel from Antioch to Iconium. Y'all can catch this in a minute. So now the crowd is now divided between what's happening with Paul and Barnabas and the Jews who are opposed to them because they don't like that the message of the gospel is being preached. <laughs> so then what happens, y'all going to like this. You know, if you can, uh, nah, I'll leave that alone. Uh, the Bible says, and so what they wanted to do was to kill them. So Paul got word that they were trying to stone him. So he said, well, I'm not going to sit here and get abused. I'm not going to sit here and just take a beat. I'm using my common sense. And he packs up his bag and he leaves. Now, you got to understand, it's interesting because when the disciples, excuse me, when the Jews came for, for Paul and for Barnabas, the Bible says, and they shook the dust off their feet. See, y'all thought Jay-Z came up with that first. <laughs> nah, I know you said get the dirt off your shoulders. No, they were shaking the dust off their feet. In other words, it's going to be whatever it's going to be. If you don't want me to be here, I'm going to leave and I'm going to let it be where it's going to be. I'm going to move on with my life. Now, don't call me. Don't text me. Don't ask me to come back. I'm going to shake the dust off my feet. See, some of y'all need to learn how to walk away from stuff. And Paul said, I'm shaking the dust off my feet. I did everything I could to help. I did everything I could to serve you. I did everything I, I could to assist you, but you didn't want it. No problem. I'm moving on. And and they tried to stone him, but he got word. You got to thank God for snitches. Y'all, y'all, y'all quiet. You, you got to, <laughs> I know it's against street code, but you got to thank God for snitches because if somebody didn't come back and tell Paul, I'm letting you know they're trying to, they're trying to kill you over here. He wouldn't have got out of town. But the Bible says that when he hears the word, he leaves Iconium and then he goes to Lystra. Now we're in our text. Y'all ready? Here it is, verse 19. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. <laughs> You're going to like this. From Antioch to Lystra is 100 miles. Okay. No car, no tram. No Uber, no bike, no, no plane, no bus. I hate you so much. I can't stand your guts this much that I'm going to travel a hundred miles to make sure you don't live. Y'all don't hear. It is the Jews from Antioch and Iconium that came to Lystra. Why you keep following me? Because here it is. Y'all ready for this? This is the word called persecution, which is, comes from the root word pursue. So if the enemy isn't pursuing you, we got to question your assignment. Because the enemy doesn't want you to reach your destination. And if you do one thing in one area and you succeed and move to another area and succeed, now we have a pattern of success and I want to stop your success. So I'm going to do everything I can to divide people, pulling them from you and your assignment. And I came to tell somebody at this service this morning and my online family, the reason why the enemy has been coming after you is because he sees the great on your life and he's trying everything he can giving it a hundred percent to stop you but I got good news for you he can't nah 
He can't, he can form the weapon, but it won't prosper. I didn't say you wouldn't get hit. I just said he wouldn't take you out. Let me prove my point. Let me prove my point. Let me paint my picture. and We get out of here in six minutes and seven seconds. So here it is. Paul now goes to Lystra. And the Jews from Antioch and Iconium now travel to Lystra. Having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, this is not a point. I can't stay here long, but I just want to give you this because I thought it would help you. When I was reading this, the Bible says in Acts chapter 13 that it was Paul and Barnabas. When he went to Iconium and then they healed the man, it was Paul and Barnabas. But when we get to verse 19, where Barnabas? You got to understand, some people are not as much of a threat as you are. Uh, that's not our point. I just want to share that with you. Go study that in your own, on your own time. So here it is. But they persuaded the multitudes and they stoned Paul. Now here it is. Please hear this. I preach this message and it's blessing people. And now the people I helped are now turning on me. And then the people who invited me to speak that I spoke for, that multitude showed up, that now they hate me, are now trying to kill me. So now Paul is standing there in the city, and somebody picks up a rock and throws it and hits him in his head. So now everybody's picking up stones and they're throwing it at him. And he's sitting there taking the impact of every single stone from every single person that he has helped. He's being stoned by the people he taught. He's being stoned by the people he poured into. He's being stoned by the people he prayed for. He's being stoned by the people he gave money to. He's being stoned by the people that he, he lost sleep over. He's, he's being stoned by the people he served. And what do you do when you're getting stoned by the very people you gave your life for? And now the apostle Paul is taking these hits and he's going down and now he's bloody and he's bruised and the dirt from the dirt is now getting into his, his wounds and now he has all types of things. He has concussions and he has blows to the head and he's got ankles and knees and everything are bloody and now people are stoning him to the point that now they think he's dead. How do you handle when you are doing something for God and you get to a point that everybody you love, support, gave, prayed for, fasted for turns on you. Can you stand there and take it? No, you say you call. Let's talk to the call because there's a part of your call. This is what we miss in the Christian church in America. We want to preach blessings and houses and cars and money. But can you handle persecution? Can you stand there and say, I believe the Bible says that marriage is between one man and one woman. That's what the Bible says. I believe that adultery is a sin. I believe that being addicted to all types of chemicals and, and all types of drugs is not what God has for you. We need to talk about racism and all of the things that exist in this country. We need to talk about inequities and we need to talk about redlining. We need to talk about redrawing lines of districts. We need to talk about the power plays. We need to talk about these things and when you stand up for these things, people want to uh, 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 persecute you but that's what comes with the territory. So you got to be able to stand on on your ground which is the word of God and say this is what the Bible says about this and it's not that I hate you this is just what I believe and some people won't like you and say it's hate and it's this and it's that it is not hate it is what I believe and when you stand on what you believe you will be persecuted for what you believe your job ain't persecuting you just because you got a two dollar raise that ain't persecution you got to understand when you stand for God 
Y'all quiet. When you stand for God and say this is right and this is wrong, this is when persecution comes. And can I tell you, some church folk don't like what I just said, but you're going to be all right. Read your Bible. <laughs> when you understand what the Bible says about a thing, you stand there and watch God work out the rest. And if you know I'm telling the truth, put your hands together and give God praise right there. So watch this. Here it is, and let me say this. In a, no, stay focused. When you are being stoned, Paul doesn't respond. And I thought about this. Now, this is just my imagination. I can't say that this actually happened, but it made me think. The Bible says early in the book of Acts that Paul was a child. And he was a part of an experience where they stoned a man by the name of Stephen. And while they were stoning Stephen and he was on the ground being stoned after preaching the word, the Bible says, and he looked up. This right here make you run. Stephen is on the ground and he looks up. And the Bible says, and he saw Jesus standing. All right, y'all don't know when to run. All right. The last time I read my Bible, every other time I see Jesus in heaven, he's sitting. But when you can stand up for God, God will stand up for you. He said, you're going to stand there and take it. I'm going to stand. When you, when God stands up on your behalf, you've earned some major respect. And the Bible says that he saw Stephen get stoned, but he didn't fight back. Stephen got stoned, but he didn't throw a rock back. Stephen sat there and preached the gospel, and he saw what God did through Stephen. Now, I believe, the Apostle Paul is sitting here going, wait a minute. I got an example. I saw somebody who preached the same message I preached, and I saw how he handled his persecution. So now I have an example on how to handle my persecution. And so the Bible said they stoned him to the point that Paul had to pass out and they thought he was dead. Then they take his body and they drag him out of the city. Read your Bible. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're being dragged, but you're being dragged to a right place. I'm going to prove my point in the middle. See, they didn't leave him in the city. They had to drag him out of the city. I came to tell you they need to drag you because they need to move you from where you are to where you need to be. They need to drag your name because it's going to make you move. They need to drag what they think you are because it's going to reposition you. And the Bible says that he's now dragged out of the city. And now he's outside left for dead he's bleeding he's bruised he's hurt he's injured he maybe has fractured bones i don't know but he's sitting here a bloody mess a dirty mess trying to figure out what's gonna happen but verse 20 bless my life it said however look at your name however it means god is continuing something else even though other people didn't cut you off you don't hear what i'm saying some of y'all need to have an, I have an however praise. This is happening however I believe. I don't have everything that I need for this bill. However, my God will provide. I know everything in my body ain't acting right, but I believe however I believe he's going to heal. I know I'm struggling in my mind. However, he's going to give me peace. Passing my understanding. Yeah, everything ain't right in my family. However, my house will serve the Lord. You got to have a however in your spirit spirit it says however when the disciples gathered around him my god look at your neighbor and say neighbor you need the right surroundings you need the right people because the bible says when the disciples gathered around him he rose up i came to tell you that when you get the right people around you what they thought was dead it's gonna get ready to come to life i came to tell you it's not over and i came to tell you to keep pushing now do me a favor before i close this message touch your neighbor say neighbor 
I believe in you. That's why I showed up when everybody else left you. Because I believe in you. That's why I'll text you. Don't worry. Hold your head up. God has more for you. Because I believe in you. That's why I'll walk across the room and give you a hug. Because I believe in you. This is why I follow up and check up on you. It's because I believe in you. And your neighbor needs to hear those words. Tell them one more time, I believe in you. So since I believe in you and I believe in you, you can't quit because God has too much for you to do. And the Bible says, and he rose up. Look at your neighbor and say, I got guts. What do you mean you got guts? He went back into the city that they stoned him. I'm going to show everybody who tried to take me out that it didn't work. And I never left. I just walked out the city to recover myself from what you did I came to tell you life back to your life I pray people that speak life into your life I come against every attack of the enemy trying to take you out because you don't believe in you I came to tell you today I believe in you your neighbor believes in you your friends believe in you your church family believes in you and I need you to understand that if God has put something in your spirit it's your time to get it pull on your neighbor one more time to say neighbor it's your time to go back to where they stoned you you can't be afraid to go back to the place where the damage took place you got to be able to stand there and say this is where it happened but I'm not gonna allow this experience to stop me from where I'm going can I testify in my college years I made a bad decision one night and went down to Charleston to do something on my way back from Charleston I got into a bad car accident at a certain mile marker and every time I would drive on 26 and get to that mile marker I would start crying because I remember the pain from that place but one day my sister called me asking me for some help and I was driving down the Charleston and I passed that mile marker and tears started coming out my eyes but I realized it wasn't pain cries of pain it was tears of joy I said God I want to thank you this is a stone that reminds me of where I was but where it didn't end I came to tell you it's not over until God says it's over it's not over until God says it's over and you got breath in your body keep pushing you still breathing keep pushing if you got breath in your body keep praising him and watch God turn it because we believe in you for the last time pull on your neighbor I don't care if you know him pull on your neighbor and say neighbor you coming out of this and you getting ready to shock everybody that threw a stone at you because now you can look at him and say I forgive you I forgive you I forgive you and I forgive you I I know you didn't know no better. I know you were out your mind. I know you were manipulated. I knew you were persuaded. I not only forgive you, I forgive them too. Because he who is sunset free is free indeed. And I speak freedom over your life today. And give God praise if you know that better is yet to come. Because God believes in you. Hallelujah. Hear me. I believe in you. The apostles came because they heard he was dead. When they got there, he just laying there. But they picked him up. And somebody said, wait a minute. And they put their, their ear in his chest. They said, wait a minute. His heart still beating. Wait a minute. He has, he's breathing. It's low, but he's still breathing. Let's nurse him back to health. 
You need people in your life who can nurse you back to health. They're not judging you. They're not even telling you to stop. You know, we don't want this to happen again. So I need you to stop preaching. They understood what came with the call. This is why the group that you are connected to must have a similar assignment or understand the weight of the assignment. Because someone who was not called to that will, will talk you out of it. But someone who is called to it understands this is what comes with it and this is how you adjust and we got the support to help you when you go back. And the enemy doesn't want you to know your assignment. And he wants the experience you had with being stoned to be the experience to make you walk away. I came to tell you you got to keep going. The, the, text, the text says, the text says, he goes right back to the same place. If you look at the journey of Paul, the missionary journey of Paul, you know what Paul does? He goes right back to all of the same places that ran him off. The strength to be able to walk into a room or a space of people who are against you, but you don't let that move you because you know you're supposed to be there. This persecution, hear me, we're gonna pray. This persecution in the text is coming from the word. The word, not a degree. The word. God is requiring his church to get his standards back. God is requiring us to have a heart for him again. God is saying, I called you. The apostle Paul was killing Christians. He then saves him. He goes through uh, years of training and then come back and now he's preaching the gospel because he's trying to reach those that other people would have never reached. We have to get the heart of God again for people. It's about the people. He didn't come for us to get a house. You don't need Jesus for a house. You need a credit score and a job. <laughs> We, we, we teach and we preach. I'm praying for favor. Favor, 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 favor. Let me tell you something. There's a difference for praying for favor and praying for a favor. And what we were preaching is preaching for a favor, not favor. Favor is which one do I choose? Not can you give me a hookup? We have to change and adjust ourselves for what God is calling all of us to do. But when you leave here today, no matter what you're dealing with, I want you to be reminded that you have a family that says, I believe in you. I want you to lift your hands. And if you're able to stand, stand to your feet. Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray in this moment, God, that you would bless your people to understand their assignment and not to let the attack, the attack pull them off course. Father, in this moment, I pray that you would give strength to my brothers and my sisters now. God, that you would give them what they need and remind them of your strength, remind them of your power, Remind them of what you have said about them. You've called them to be a prophet to the nations. You ordained them to be a mouthpiece. 
you ordained them to work in the areas that they're working in. God, you anointed and called their families. And God, we thank you that you're speaking hope into us again to be able to walk out the things you've placed into our hands. Father, I pray now for my brothers and my sisters in this moment that you, oh God, would give them the grace to walk out what you have given them. God, I pray that you will begin to convict us of the things we do wrong. And I pray, God, that you will convict us of the things that are not right in our lives. Because this is not about us. This is about you. And Father, we thank you in this moment for what you're doing. We thank you for elevating us. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for instructing us. But God, we thank you that you're empowering us. And we thank you and we give you praise knowing that it is done. And if you agree with that prayer, I want you to put your hands together and give God praise for what he's doing in your, your life. Listen, before you take your seat, if you're here today and you're saying, listen, I need to get my life together. I realize there's some things that, that I just have to get together. We want to open up the altar. So if you're here today and you want to get saved or rededicate your life or join our church family, you can make that move right now. And we want to welcome you to what God has next for you. And I want you to start giving God praise for next. Won't you say, I'm giving God praise for what's next. If you're here, I want to get my life to Christ. I can't do this without him because you can't. I want to be able to make that decision to sit on my feet in a church home where I have the support and be surrounded around people who can nurse me back to help the church. It's open. It's, even if you're watching online, you can respond to the information below. Amen. We thank God for our sister. Can we give God, give God praise for her? Is there anyone else? We'll wait on you. It's just that important. You're just that important. Amen. They're going to take you in a room and get some information from you. Oh, we have another that's coming. I'm moving too fast. Is this someone else who is interested either giving their life to Christ, rededicating your life, or being a part of our church family? Amen. Anyone else? Touch your neighbor and say, you, you need somebody to walk down with you? You don't have to do it by yourself. You don't have to be scared. I got you. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise one more time for, for these who have come. Amen. Before you take your seats, do me a favor and say, I'm to two people and say, I'm excited about your future. I'm excited about your future. To our online family. Thank you. Listen. I want to say to our online family, thank you for watching. I know there are a lot of people who watch us before they go to their church and serve. And, uh, and I'm glad that we could be an encouragement. Um, I want to ask everyone to prepare your hearts to give, even those who, who are watching online before you go to your church. Not trying to pull resources from where you serve. But if we're being a blessing to you, if you could sow some seed, what we see happening isn't because of um, it's free it takes resources to make all of these things happen and so thank you for your giving thank you for your sowing and I believe in God's going to do great things I believe the brook is good ground um, I believe that and God's going to do more and so if you need an offering envelope you can raise your hand I'll ushers be more than happy to give that to you if you're giving electronically you can text um, the Brook, all one word, to 73256. Thank you again for your, your generosity, your heart to give, and your support. Did the word bless anybody today? I, uh, it, what's, what's so encouraging to me is um, I sent my wife a link. I said, hey, I need you to watch this. Something's going on in this city. I want you to watch it. And, um, and we watched the video and uh, to see one of our own who uh, grew up in the church now in news and uh, to see him on, on screen is just so encouraging. And so uh, the next generation, listen to me, is coming up. It's not next, they're now. 
You hear me? And so we want to make sure to see so many of our, I'm going to say younger uh, church members doing big things, um, things you wouldn't even know they're doing. You're looking at them and they're 28, 29, 27, somewhere in there, and you're like, some even younger than that, and you're like, oh, yeah, they're trying to get their lives together. And you'd be like, if you talk to them, you'd be like, oh, you're doing a whole lot better than I thought. You got a good head on your shoulder. And so we don't need to be dragging the next generation. We need to be celebrating, encourage them. them. And so uh, keep doing what y'all doing. Keep doing, keep pushing. Um, keep leading and watch God open this door. So we're going to pray. We're going to let you go. Father, we thank for both gift and giver. We thank you for the seed that we're sowing. We pray, God, that you would multiply this 30, 60, even 100 fold. We stand in amazement of how much you're able to do with so little. That God, we pray that you would use this for ministry and for people. God, we thank you now for how you would keep your people. Oh, God, that you would meet their needs. And we thank you because we are not giving where we're living but we're sowing where we're going. Father, also we pray for this week, traveling mercies over the dangerous highways. We thank you, God, for a successful, happy, joyous, and exciting week. We bind up the hand of the enemy that would try to cause confusion and division and all types of things that will cause the body of Christ not to move forward. But God, we thank you, knowing that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And God, we thank you that every place we put our foot is ours. And we give you glory in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. All right, left and right section, stand to your feet. Follow the direction of our ushers. Center section, stay seated and make a friend. Mom!